Okay, now Sumitra is going to come and read the scripture. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 to 8. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciple came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of the of birth banks. Thanks. Uh, oh, this is the word of God. Good morning. Please pray with me one more time. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather and we desire to continue to worship you as we open your word. Please give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us to listen for your voice and be eager to hear from you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, I find it amazing to think that we are already at the end of another year. The older I get, the faster they seem to tick off. December 31st, and we have 2024 starting a new year. It's pretty amazing. It's a good time to reflect on the past year and look ahead to the new year. Um, as most of you know, uh, our pastor, Pastor Greg, is in the U.S. in Texas with his family for a couple of months, so we should continue to remember them in prayer. Uh, but I know that um, um, he has had to line up a number of speakers for the Sunday services while he's gone, and he was particularly interested in this day being the 31st, a significant day, the last day, uh, with the new year coming, and he, he worked very hard to try to find just the right speaker for such a serious occasion, and he looked all over Korea, he tried very hard to find the best theologian he could find. He looked high and low. And he found the person. Unfortunately, he asked the person if they would come and speak, and the person said no, they weren't able to come. But Pastor Greg didn't give up. He's like a bulldog. So he thought, well, if I can't get the best theologian, I will find the most eloquent speaker in English in all of Korea. And he looked high and low all over the peninsula, and he found the person, amazingly, and he asked the person, will you come and speak at HIC on this day? And the person said, no. He was a little sad, but he didn't give up. So he said, well, I'm not going to give up. I will try to find the most handsome speaker, the most handsome man in all of Korea. He looked all over Korea. He finally found the person. And he asked the person if he would come and speak. And well, I didn't have the heart to turn him down three times in a row, so I said yes. <laughs> okay, now, I know that that's kind of silly, but I know that you're awake, so, so we, can, we can begin. Um, about a month ago, um, I don't speak very often, but uh, there was a message about um, the book of Revelation, an overview, and the idea with that message was that oftentimes we stay away from the book of Revelation because we think it's just too confusing, it's too hard. And we get lost in all of the symbolism and the little details. And really, that's understandable, but we should not shy away from any part of God's word. In fact, the author says that there's a special blessing for those who read and heed or take to heart the message given in the book of Revelation. And... So I think one thing that we can do that can help us is if we try to have a clear understanding of the broad overall structure of the book of Revelation, and if we have a clear understanding of the big picture, then we can better understand and learn from the symbolic language and the details of the book of Revelation. 
So I'm going to do uh, a three-minute review uh, of the message that I gave maybe a month or so ago. And the idea of this review is simply to lay a little foundation or review the foundation from last time and then we'll build on it today. Um, we know that the Bible is God's word and we take God's word literally. We also recognize that in the Bible there are different genres or different types of writing. There are parables. There is history. There is poetry like the Psalms. There are... Uh, um, there's, there's law. There's also um, apocalyptic literature, which means God visits a person and gives them a vision with very symbolic and, and colorful language to give a specific message about the future. Um, so we know, for example that although we take the Bible literally, we don't want to take it literalistically. For example, one day John the Baptist is with his disciples and he sees Jesus walking by and he says, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, we don't want to interpret that to say Jesus suddenly transfigured into a furry creature with four legs going ba ba. Well, it says, he said he's the lamb. No, we know that he's speaking symbolically, understanding that all of the many sheep and lambs that were sacrificed under the old covenant were merely pictures foretelling the future coming of the Messiah who would put away our sins forever when he offered his life on the cross for us. So we take the Bible literally we understand symbolic language is sometimes used and we should be able to recognize that if we want to interpret the meaning correctly. And we understand that the wonderful visions in the book of Revelation use a lot of symbolic language. How do we know what it means? Many times the symbols are defined clearly for us. Sometimes in a particular passage, the symbol is not defined, but we see how that same symbol is used in other places of Scripture, and we can understand the meaning of the symbol being used. Um, we also, and I think this is the primary point last month, we have to be wise in understanding how the book of Revelation is structured. And we talked about the problems that can arise when we try to interpret the book of Revelation with the rhetorical mindset of, say, a 20th century American. We are taught to think in a very linear manner, A, B, C, D, chrono in a chronological manner. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's the way Westerners tend to think and organize their thoughts. Um, but we understand that John, who was used to write the book of Revelation, it seems did not organize his thoughts that way. He organized them the way a first century Middle Easterner would. Some people would argue that the book of Revelation, especially from chapter 4 to the end, is simply a, a linear chronology of everything that will happen in the last seven years of the Earth's history. But when we read the book carefully, this causes us a lot of problems and confusion because we find that it doesn't seem to be organized that way. In fact, years ago I had great confusion because I would read a couple of chapters in the book of Revelation and then the end of the age would come. Then I would read a couple more chapters and then again the end of the age would come. How many times can the end come, right? Doesn't the end just come once? And so we understand that Revelation is not organized in a chronological linear manner. It's a series of seven visions. The first section is introductory. In chapter 1, we, we learned that the thesis of this book is the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ and, at the, and the end of the age. And then when we get from chapter 3 on, 
we see six parallel sections. And they all cover the same age span. That is the time between Messiah's first coming and the time between his second coming. Therefore, we see the end referred to six different times. And each parallel section covers the same time span, but it has a different emphasis. And when we can understand this structure and organization, then we're better able to understand the overall meaning of the book of Revelation and even the symbols and how they fit in to this structure. Um, in our scripture reading, Sumi read from Matthew and Jesus was talking to his disciples about the end of the age. What will be the sign of your coming? And he gives them what, he, what, what is referred in other places as the signs of the times. He talks about difficult and, and cat, uh, catastrophic events like, like famines, wars and rumors of wars, the, the arrival of false Christs, earthquakes, and, and uh, natural disasters. He says these are signs that will come and they will be present during this entire age between his first coming and his second coming. However... As we get closer and closer to the second coming, they will be like birth pains. I admire you ladies. I'm thankful I have never experienced birth pains, so God bless you. But um, they become more and more severe, and they come more often, or they become more frequent as the time of birth draws near. And that's what these signs would be like. And Jesus, I think, gives us these not so that we can make predictions about when he will come again. Not so we can speculate about specific dates or times. But so that we can be vigilant and we can be watchful. We can be looking forward to his coming again with eagerness. And we can be ready. We don't know when he'll come, but we we can be ready when he does come. And that's one of the reasons he highlights these signs of the times. The title of this message is An Overview of the Book of Revelation, Part 2, Seals, Trumpets, and Bowls. And I think what we will see as we dig a little bit deeper is that there will be a series of uh, seals opening up catastrophic events, trumpets, and bowls that do the same thing. And these, I think, all are connected to these signs of the times. They will become more frequent and more severe the nearer the end comes. If we want to better understand the book of Revelation, it will be very helpful if we can understand how the seals, the bowls, the trumpets, and the bowls fit in to the overall structure of the book of Revelation. And I have my notes all turned around and out of order, so here we go. And I wonder if we could see the next slide. I don't know how well you can see that, but just to quickly review, and this we looked at about a month ago, we see the, um, the, the parallel sections in the book of Revelation the first section from the ver first, first three chapters of Revelation are introductory, and we see six parallel sections, and each of these six sections has a specific reference to the end of the age and the second coming. And we talked last time again how each of these six sections span the time from the first to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In section two... Uh, the seven seals are introduced and explained. In section three, the seven trumpets are explained. And then in chapters 15 and 16, in the fifth parallel section, we, we get the uh, teaching about the seven bowls. So the question is this. When do these seals, trumpets, and bowls occur? 
How do they relate to one another? And the first thing we should understand is the seven seals, the seven seals that we'll read about occur all during the time between the first and second coming. The seven bowls occur, sorry, the seven trumpets all occur in the span between the first and second coming, as do the seven bowls. But they will become more frequent and more intense as we draw near to the end. We will also see in a minute that the seals open up into the trumpets, or they are a logical consequence of the seals. The trumpets open up into the seven bowls. They are related in a cause and effect manner. So if the seven seals open up into the seven trumpets, and the seven trumpets open up into the seven bowls, then what brings about the seven seals? What causes them? And who or what opens the seals? So we will take just a minute and read Revelation chapter 5. And I'm going to try very long to not talk too long so I'll go pretty fast, and if you have questions, I'd be happy to talk to you more. When we read chapter 5 of Revelation, this is a very beautiful chapter, and I encourage you to read this again and again and meditate on it. This is a scene which is happening in heaven, and we see that God is seated on his throne, surrounded by 24 elders and angels, and in verse 1, we read this, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that is God, God the Father, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. I just wonder what it would be like to be the Apostle John seeing this vision and how much he understood of what he was seeing. But here is the book with the, with the seven seals. And apparently it was very important to have this book opened up, but no one was found worthy to do it. No one was found worthy. And John is weeping and weeping. He's crying his eyes out. What a sad thing. What a serious, somber occasion. And then he receives a comforting word. In verse 5, one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Obviously, as you know, this is a clear reference to Jesus Christ. He is the only one who could do it. No one else could do what only he could do. And the most amazing thing is not just that he was the only one who was able to do it. He was willing to do it. He was not obligated to do so. He did so voluntarily or willingly. And as we read on, we see in verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. Amazing. A lamb. A lamb standing right in the presence of God the Father. He's standing as if slain. How many dead animals do you know can stand up? This is a lamb that has been slain and yet now is standing. This is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if you picture this lamb, obviously it had been butchered or its throat had been cut. It had been slain, but it's standing. And then we see that it has seven horns. Wow, that must be kind of an odd creature. A lamb standing as if slain with seven horns. See the beautiful symbolism. 
Jesus, who has died, is now living again. The lamb who took all of our sins upon himself died but did not remain dead. He has seven horns. And we see over and over again that horns represent strength or power. And we know that the number seven symbolically represents completion or perfection. He is almighty. This lamb who was slain and is now standing and living is almighty. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. And we read on to see that not only does he have seven horns, but he has seven eyes. He sees and knows all. The seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. And we read, of, we read about them when we talked about them last month in Revelation 1 in a reference to the Trinity. We know that there aren't seven Holy Spirits, right? There's one Holy Spirit. But he also is Almighty God. He is divine. So we see that the Lamb and the Holy Spirit are working in perfect unison together with the Father who is sit sitting on the throne. He is the one who was found worthy to take the scroll and break the seals and open up the book. And then, later on in verse 9, I'll jump down, we see great worship and praise come about, next slide please, as a result of the Lamb opening the book and breaking the seals. And in verse 9, and they, the redeemed, sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. You were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you've made them a kingdom of priests. So we see that Jesus being willing to take the book and break the seals and, and, and do what he's done, that through this act, Jesus is bringing to completion progressive, redemptive history. He's the only one who can bring and provide salvation for his people, and he's willing to do it. So we read then that we see again in verses 7 through 10 the great praise that is rightfully being given to the Lamb who has broken the seals and brought about redemptive history by the heavenly host. And it made me think when we see a lamb, a lamb is not a very strong animal, right? And I hear they're not very smart. Uh, but we see a lamb standing as if slain, and it makes me think of the words of Michael Card, the Michael Card song, Speaking about God's grace, your most awesome work was done in the frailty of your son. Your most awesome work was done in the frailty of your son. So we see that uh, Jesus has broken the seals and he's opened up the seals. And then we read in Revelation chapter 1 verse chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. This is the passage that talks about the seals. And there will be a series of seven seals that we read about. When I saw then, then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard the four living creatures say with a voice of thunder, Come. And I look, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So here is the $64,000 question. Who is the rider on the right horse? Who is the rider on this horse? And it's very interesting, I think, if we look a little deeper, we can see it's very clear that the rider on the white horse is none other than the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We compare Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, with Revelation 19. In Revelation 6, sorry, Revelation 6, 2, the description is only one verse long. It's a little bit longer in Revelation 19. But notice, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. 
and he who sat on, sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, are many crowns. He has a name written upon him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. This is Jesus. And this is Jesus at his glorious second coming. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, and along with him are the armies of heaven, us coming with him in glory at his second coming. So if we look, next slide please, if we look and briefly compare, sorry, I don't know if you can see that, but if we see in Revelation 6-2, comparing that with Revelation 19, we see the rider is on a white horse in both cases. We see that the rider has a weapon of warfare in both cases. In Revelation 6, a bow. In Revelation 15, a sword. We see in both cases, the rider is coming in conquest and in victory. In Revelation 6, 2, we see that the rider has a crown. In Revelation 19, the rider has more than one crown. He has many crowns. So I think the picture is clear. Remember the seals span the time between the first and second coming of the Messiah. Revelation 6, the rider on the white horse, is Jesus at his first coming. In Revelation 19, it's appearing at the end of section 6, that's Jesus at his second coming. The rider in this case is the same. It's Jesus the Messiah. Now some people would say, wait a minute. We know that Revelation 19 happens to be the second coming of Jesus Christ, but Revelation 6 happens earlier in the book of Revelation. So the, the writers look like they're the same person, but if we, if we take it in just a linear chronology, then they make the assumption that, uh-oh, that means the writer in Revelation 6 must be the Antichrist then. And I think... That is a very misguided interpretation and misses the whole point of this section. Misunderstands the organization and structure of the book and how things work together. If we want to look a little bit deeper, and for the sake of time I'm going to go very quickly, but we see that uh, the first seal is the rider on the first horse, Christ at his first coming. And then we see there are three more horses to come. A rider on a red horse is the second seal, and it talks about warfare and death. In this case, um, William Hendrickson in his book makes a very compelling case that this is not talking about general warfare. That will be talked about later. This is talking about persecution of God's people. In the third seal, the rider on the black horse talks about economic hardship, especially for the poor. Seal 4 in verses 7 and 8 talks about serious famine and plagues, even death. And seal 5 talks about martyrdom. There will even be some of God's people who, who are called upon to give their lives simply because they name the name of Jesus. So what we see here is that um, the Messiah has come, and when he came the first time, he brought his kingdom. The kingdom has come, but not in its full and complete and final form. That will come in its fullness, its total fullness, at the second coming. But now he has come. He has defeated Satan on the cross. We know that Satan is a defeated foe, but he's not completely put away yet. So at the coming of Jesus and the bringing of the kingdom, Satan is kicking up his heels. He is opposing and in our Christmas story, we saw the first, or an early example of that right away. 
What happened when the Magi came to visit Jesus? Herod heard about it and wanted to see them and find out the time that the star appeared. And what did he try to do or what did he actually do? He tried to kill the Messiah. And as a result, can you imagine how horrible this would have been in the entire region of Bethlehem? All of the boy babies two years and younger were killed. And this was the enemy's attempt to destroy the Messiah. Christ has come. The devil is defeated but not fully, fully put away yet. And he is opposing. So the idea of the seals is, the seals represent two things for God's people. One is, it represents the challenge and the difficulty of living in a fallen world as God's people. Sin is around us. We see things that are terrible and dishonoring to God. Sometimes we still struggle with our own old sinful nature. The battle is not over yet in terms of our sanctification. So the, the, the seals represent the difficulty of living in a fallen world and specifically Satan's opposition and persecution of God's people. Satan's opposition and persecution of God's people. Sometimes it may even result in martyrdom. That's what we read about in the fifth seal. Now it's very interesting when we look at the sixth seal, we see in verse 17, Christ's second coming. Christ's second coming. Why don't we see that in the seventh seal? Why do we see that in the sixth seal? Well, I think we see that in the sixth seal, the reference to the second coming, because in the seventh seal, we see a reference to the trumpets that are coming. So what we learn is the trumpet judgments are a consequence of the seals. In other words, anyone who persecutes God's people, anyone who Satan uses to persecute God's people, they may not realize it, but they are on very shaky ground because God loves his people and he does not disregard or take it lightly when the enemy persecutes us. There will be consequences. And the consequences of the persecution of God's people expressed through the seals are the trumpet judgments. Trumpets are meant to be blown. Trumpets sound a warning. And that's what the trumpet judgments do. We see in Revelation, our next verse, please, next one. In the fifth seal, sorry, go back one more. Yeah, Revelation 6. This is the fifth seal. The lamb broke the seal, we see, and underneath, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony they maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood? Revelation the fifth seal talks about the prayers of God's people who are suffering, crying out to God for, for, for mercy and, for, and for, uh, to be sustained. Also, we see in the next verse, please, in Revelation 8, we are about to introduce the seven trumpet judgments. And in verse 4, we read, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder, sounds and flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. What do we see? The trumpet judgments are the response of God's people's prayers and crying out to God in their suffering their unjust suffering, 
And there will be a consequence for those who persecute God's people. Still, even in the judgments, the trumpet judgments, we still see God's mercy. Trumpets call out a warning. And the warning to the people who are persecuting God's people and opposing God is meant to call them to repentance. We still see God's mercy toward the lost. He's giving them yet another opportunity to turn away from sin and selfishness and to turn to God. And that's what the trumpets indicate. The trumpets are listed primarily in Revelation 8 and 9. And we see these kinds of disasters that have been mentioned in Matthew with the signs of the times. In the first trumpet, one-third of the grass and trees are destroyed. In the second trumpet, one-third of the sea is destroyed. In the third trumpet, a third of the fresh water is polluted. In the fourth trumpet, one-third of the heavenly lights are dimmed. So what that tells us is that these trumpet judgments upon the lost are severe, but they are not total. One-third is destroyed, not everything. There's still time for repentance for the lost if they take heed of the warnings that come. If they take heed of the warnings, there is still an opportunity for mercy. In the fifth trumpet, we see there is a demonic oppression of unbelievers. And as these, this demonic oppression happens, uh, the people who have God's seal on their forehead are not bothered. They, are, they don't have to worry about this. This is Satan's opposition or Satan's dominion over people who do not know Jesus. You know, Satan is the liar. He came to steal and kill and destroy. He was a liar from the beginning. He promises a lot, but he delivers nothing. So this is satanic and demonic oppression of the lost. And then in the sixth trumpet, we see warfare on a wide scale. It's terrible to see warfare, to see people suffer. And yet, there's a sense in which God is still reaching his hands out to people who don't know him. Stop trusting in yourself. Turn and cry out to me. The opportunity of salvation is still present when we see the trumpet judgments executed. And the trumpet judgments will lead in to the bowls. The seven bowls are described as God's wrath. Trumpets are blown and they sound a warning, but the bowl judgments are poured out. They are final. They are final. In other words, God is long-suffering and patient towards those who don't know him, and, but if they perpetually ignore the trumpet warnings, eventually final judgment will come. And that's what the bowls represent, is final judgment. We don't have time to look in great detail, but when we look at the, the bowls of God's wrath, the bowl judgments, uh, in Revelation 16, we see that the first bowl judgment is festering sores. And then we see that all of the seawater is turned to blood. All of the fresh water is turned to blood. So we see now it's not one-third. It's all. This is final. This is complete. The opportunity for repentance has gone. Final judgment has come. And we see that this is all leading to uh, a final judgment day. When we look at the bowls of wrath, it's kind of interesting to compare them with the judgments that God brought up on Pharaoh in Egypt, which resulted eventually in the Egyptian, Egyptian army being totally destroyed. We know... 
that there is a great and final judgment day coming. But that does not mean that God does not also express his wrath now and in certain ways, all leading to great final judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, it is appointed to die once and then comes the judgment. So what's he talking about? Well, I believe that this lifetime is our opportunity to repent. And when a person dies and they don't know Jesus, they go to hell. Hell is like a temporary holding cell. Suppose someone has been convicted of murder, sentence has been or they've been declared guilty. They're sent to the local prison. They come back two months later for their final designation. When a person dies physically, we should not think that they will have future opportunities to know God. Upon physical death, judgment comes. And they will be held for the final judgment, which will be forthcoming. And we'll talk about that next week. It's interesting to think about this fact and I'll see if this example makes sense. The seals and the bowl warnings and the, sorry, the seals and the trumpet warnings and the bowl judgments take place all throughout this age, all heading towards the great final judgment day. So if we look at this example, maybe it'll help us understand. Uh, look carefully at Luke chapter 13 with me. And if you're sleepy, read out loud. If you're not, just uh, take note. Because I think this is a really good example to help us better understand how these three events take place together during this age. In Luke chapter 13, we read this. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood... Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Apparently, there were a group of Galileans who upset or angered Pilate, and maybe when they were giving their sacrifices, Pilate slaughtered them, killed them. Their blood was mixed with the blood of their sacrifices in some way. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that the eight, those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So for the people who were, who were killed by Pilate and whose blood was slaughtered and mixed with their sacrifices, God's bowl of wrath had come on them. For the other Galileans who watched and observed, this is a trumpet warning for them. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Uh, this tower in Jerusalem that fell and killed 18 people, judgment had come for them. The other people who were there and somehow escaped being killed, this is a, judge, a, a trumpet warning for them. Do you think they were worse sinners than you are? No, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So we see this phenomenon, Satan's opposition and persecution of believers and the difficulty of living in a fallen world continues throughout this age. And yet, God knows how to make a distinction between those who are his and those who aren't. He takes care of his people. Also, we see that God's trumpet warnings to call the ungodly to repentance and his mercy and patience go on. But eventually, if the trumpet warnings are not heeded and people determine to continue in sin, the bold judgments will come final wrath and final punishment. 
we see that if we want to better understand the book of Revelation, we need to understand the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, how they relate with one another, when they occur, and how they fit within the broader context of the book of Revelation. Uh, in conclusion, can we go all the way... Sorry, I'm not going to make it hard for Selesh. Go back to the very first chart that showed the seven sections of the book of Revelation. So we understand then that in Revelation chapter 1, verse... Sorry, chapter 1 through chapter 3... Uh, we see the introduction to the book of Revelation and the introduction of the thesis of the book, Christ's glorious second coming. And then we see after the first section, we see six parallel sections. Each one spans the time between the first and second coming of Christ. Each one has a different emphasis. We also see that in each of these six, seven sections, there is a specific reference. Thank you. Wow, the magic red dot has appeared. We see the, that's okay. We see the, a reference to the end. So we're spanning the time between the first and second comings of Christ. The trumpets, sorry, the seals are described in section two. They run from the first, the time between the first and second coming of Christ. Again, I'm repeating, but they represent the difficulty that we have as God's people living in a fallen world in general, in particular, the spiritual warfare and battle we're in, Satan's opposition to us, including persecution, unfair treatment, and sometimes even martyrdom. We read about the, and this should not be surprising because we know Satan persecutes the Messiah and the Messiah's people. But we know that in Christ we have the victory. Section, um, section three talks about the trumpet judgments that run between the first and second coming, God's warning to those who are opposing him and persecuting his people and don't know him, repent before it's too late. There's still time for God's mercy. Then later on in the fifth section, we read about the bowls of wrath. That is God's final judgment upon those who refuse to repent. And all of this is leading to the glorious second coming of Jesus and the end of the age the new heavens and the new earth, and the renewal of all things. So next week we will continue um, because I have one more opportunity, and we are going to look at Revelation chapter 20 very carefully. Uh, there's a distinguished scholar and theologian who I respect a lot who suggested we should talk about Revelation 20 because this is perhaps the most important chapter in all of Revelation if we really want to understand the book as a whole. And so I agreed with uh, Pastor Sung Ho and his recommendation. So next week we will talk about Revelation 20 in some detail. And uh, if I have a chance at some point, not too off into the future, sorry, I'm going to throw out a little hook here. I would really like to talk about the mark of the beast because I've, stu I've read a lot about that the last few months and I think that the mark of the beast is widely misunderstood and widely sensationalized by many who I think are missing the whole point of what the mark of the beast is about. But that's a little, a little hook maybe for a future time. So I wonder if I can ask the praise team to come up as I close in a short prayer, and then we will finish with a final song. Father God, please 
Help us have teachable and humble hearts as we approach you and your word. For there's so much we need to know. There's so much we don't know. And I think we must come before your word and into your presence with humility. Because we really want to hear your voice. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to be better able to handle your word and to understand it. And I thank you for this beautiful book of Revelation. And I pray that we would not shy away from this book, but we would read it and listen for your voice. And I pray that, thank you for the chance to share a few ideas. Uh, and I pray that the congregation would go into your word and look at these things and see whether they're so or not. Not just take something I say as the absolute truth, but be eager to listen for your voice. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your protection over and your care for your people. Uh, we fall short and we struggle in many ways, but you hold us as precious in your hands. And we need not fear because you are our good shepherd and our Lord and master. We also thank you that with regard to people who do not know you yet, that your patience and long-suffering is apparent, that you are crying out, you are still giving opportunity for those who don't know you to come to know you. And we thank you, too, that um, all of history is moving to a great and glorious final culmination. Lord Jesus, when you come again and you make all things new, and you bring the end of the age and a future for your people that is far more glorious and far more wonderful than we can even imagine. We thank you, as your word says, that uh, uh, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and it has not entered the heart of a man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you and being known by you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.